From NJ.com and the Star Ledger, welcome to the Rutgers Rant, your one-stop podcast for the Scarlet Knights, with your hosts, Steve Politi and Rutgers Insiders, Brian Fonseca and Pat Lenny. Let's start shopping. All right. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to the Rant, a Selection Sunday snub edition of the Rutgers Rant. All right, right, let's. we got a lot to talk about. We're going to break this thing down from every conceivable angle, answer all of your questions. Uh, i got to start with this, though. I, I went. I woke up on Sunday morning, and I thought they were in. I did. I thought they had done enough throughout the course of the season. I thought the Purdue win combined with the 10 quad one quad two wins was enough. And I thought the big 10 tournament performance had eased up on the narrative that Rutgers didn't play well without Moat mag. I thought that would have helped all that said by no means is what happened last night. Stunning to me the, because this is exactly what can happen when you leave your fate in the hands of the selection committee. And it happens every year. I've been watching selection Sunday for a million years. Now there's always a team, always a team that's in this position. It sucks that it's Rutgers, but that's, that's what it is. Brian, right? I mean, this is, uh, this is just the reality of college basketball when you leave it in the hands of the committee. Correct. Um, Rutgers for reasons we can get into later, I guess, after the round and found out they left themselves vulnerable and uh, look, they had some bad fortune with a key player going down, right? But that can't be the reason you suddenly go from a team that's competing for, you know, a top three finish in the Big Ten to losing every quad three game you play and blowing leads and playing like bottom four team in the Big Ten. They had no answer to the Watt Mag's injury. They had no depth to fill in for him. They had a non-conference schedule that really came back to bite them. It looked like they were going to be able to avoid that issue this season by just demolishing all the quad four opponents they played. But when you're, and like you said, you're in the bubble and there's razor thin margins, uh, as the NCAA tournament committee chair, Chris Reynolds said to Chris Mad Dog Russo on the radio yesterday, as much as they're looking for reasons to put you in, they are also looking for reasons to keep you out when you're at that stage of the bubble. And Rutgers, whether people choose to ignore it as much as they do or not, had plenty of reason not to be put into the committee. Brad Wachtel, bracketologist extraordinaire, was kind of hinting at that, leaving it the breadcrumbs around Twitter the days leading up to the tournament. He explained why Rutgers wouldn't make it if they didn't make it, the many reasons. And in the end, that uh, proved costly that they weren't even the first team out of the field. They were the second team out of the field. So they weren't even as close to making the field as as we thought they were. Oklahoma State was the other was the team ahead of the right, yeah, and, and all those teams, the teams that are right down the bubble. And we've spent all this time like looking at Nevada, looking at uh, NC State. This is this is what jumps out to me. All right, the, the the last four teams in had a combined four quad three losses. Rutgers had for itself, right? I mean, is it? it, it believe me, I'm, I've, I've I've fudged the metrics before. I'm pretty sure that's right. I mean, Pat, when you saw it, what was your first reaction? And was there a team when you're like, oh, come on? I mean, was there a moment when you're like, ah, come on, they can't put Nevada in. You can't put Arizona State in. They've got a, they've got a net ranking 66. You can't put it in. I mean, was there a moment where you thought that? I thought NC State was the one that was a real wow. And NC State had, I think, zero quad one wins or maybe one. Maybe one, one. Yeah. one did one. And uh, I thought that one was a little shocking. Um. It, but it just comes back to this the same thing, and the, the the chairman said it over and over again. Rutgers played poorly without Mawat Mag and the strength of schedule. They took the two criteria that Rutgers really lacked in and just hammered them with it. So, um, I think compared to the other teams, like that's what it comes down to. They looked at the most negative things they could possibly look at about Rutgers and just and just. Steve Peichel was pounding his cell phone. The chair, the committee was pounding Rutgers with these two poor pieces of criteria. That's what it comes down to. <laughs> what a sad, what a sad fate, an unnecessary death for the cell phone, unfortunately. And, and I, I like this another thing we, I, I kept on saying, and I kept on writing, and people kind of looked, thought I was the crazy old man who has a television set that, you know, that, that the selection committee watched games, right? They watched games. And I have no doubt what happened. In my mind, there's no doubt that. That they watched, they saw it happen, they either saw the score, saw they lost in Minnesota, and then they were attuned. They were they were watching the Northwestern game. It was one of the few games on that night, Sunday night. And they saw what we saw. Everyone who was in the building 
at the rack on Sunday, left with that same kind of sickening feeling like, oh, God, this looks like an NIT team. Just the way they played that game, you know, just out of sync completely, lost to a team they were, that, you know, right on the same level with them, didn't really compete well in that game, it looked terrible offensively. And this quote right there, this quote from the selection committee guy in that interview with Mike and Mad Dog, we had several games we could observe them from February 7th on, and they had a difficult time. I, I mean, Brian is right. You know, I mean, the eye test. You don't even have to watch the games. The numbers speak for themselves. They lost. This is a team that lost three straight home games to end the year by double digits. One of them was to Nebraska, which as much as you want to say they're playing well and that Kaisei Tominaga is electric, they're still the 12th place team in the Big Ten. It was to them by 12. You you have one of the worst offensive performances possible against Michigan, a fellow bubble team, another team you're competing to enter the field with. And you blow a 10-point lead with 65 seconds to go against Minnesota. If you're yeah. on the bubble, that that you need that game. You cannot lose that game. And you blow a 10-point lead in 65 seconds, you have no one to blame but yourself to play that poorly for that long. And the, the, the other thing is that, one, like you said, there's a good sample size there. There's 10 games that they had without Mag, and he's not coming back. He's out for the year. This is what Rutgers is right now. So it's it's not the eye test. It's, it's the numbers, too. The numbers are... Are horrendous. They had the 200th ranked offense nationally in efficiency in that in those ten games. Like it, they they played bad. It, it is what it is. I think it's a totally fair uh, thing to hold Rutgers uh, hold against Rutgers. And they, listen, they they again they, they they all they had to do was win one quad three game, one quad three game. Maybe win one game at home. Maybe you know they, there's so many opportunities they had and they let it slip. And yeah, look, it, go back it, to the non-conference schedule. We can get into later, but they gave themselves yeah. no no cushion by playing seven quadrant four uh, games, and you know that, that's another thing. Yeah, I mean, I, let's talk about that. The, the schedule thing is is big. Go ahead, Pat. You you were going to make a point. Yeah, I just wanted to make one point about teams that got in over Rutgers, and this was pointed out by Aaron Brightman on Twitter, and I thought it was a really good uh, a really good point. He said the one the one comp to Rutgers that's kind of maddening is Providence. Their best yeah. non-conference win was beating Ryder by one at home. They lost to Seton Hall by 24, went four and six uh, down the stretch, played 11 Q4 games and went four and eight in those and seven and 10 against quad one and two. Providence was that one final team that got in as the number 11 seed and Rutgers, that was the the dagger as you wrote, Steve. Right. So. Yeah. And, I, I, and I made the note that but I will say, and Providence along those lines had the 354th best non-conference schedule, which is 12 spots below Rutgers. The one thing I, I, I clearly that pop Providence, they had moved Providence out of that last four consideration, right? They yeah. had decided that yeah. Providence was higher ranked than Rutgers. NC State, the same, same thing. You can debate it, but when they were making the decision, they had made, they had moved on. They had already had Providence ahead of those teams. I mean, I thought there was a good case. It was close. Again, it was close, but it comes back to it comes back to that. All right, let's. I want to talk about the non-conference because it was a huge topic. Steve Peichel hates the question. He had to know it was coming last night. Hated it was coming. It didn't come from us. Thank you, Ryan Dunleavy, for asking the question about the uh, non-conference schedule. I, I get that they tried this schedule Gonzaga. I don't know the entire story there. Um, that they were looking for upgrades. They didn't get it, and it's the same similar schedule that they've had the first seven years of Steve Peichel's there. I don't sense. I mean, I don't. Get, I didn't get the sense that they were, you know, like it was something. Oh, we're going to look at this. We're going to fix it. You know, Brian, what did you? What was your takeaway from what Steve Peichel said about the schedule? And just, and I'm curious, was it as big a factor as a, a defining factor, or was it like a tie breaking factor in this in this one? So to be clear, the committee uses the net uh, ranking of the non conference schedule. I, I think the one you referenced was Ken Palm, and the net right. province is 289, which is uh, almost 40 spots, no, almost 30 spots better. Spots better. Another thing with Providence, they had the same amount of quad one wins as Rutgers, four. They had one quad three loss and zero quad four losses. So in 15 Q3 and Q4 games, they had one loss. Rutgers had four in 13. So Rutgers had more bad losses and less opportunities. And look, Providence- Rutgers also beat number one Purdue that we don't ever talk about. Providence beat three top 20 teams in Ken Palm. They had, they had good wins. They had, as many, they had as many good wins as Rutgers, although those three were at home. My point is we could debate all these things back and forth because these teams put themselves in that position. Rutgers should not have been in that position, especially because they were 16-7. and seven, They were second in the Big Ten. They had all those big wins, and they just completely imploded down the stretch. Not a conference schedule. The issue is that Rutgers had eight games that it 
kind of chose. One of them, the Seton Hall game you play every year. Uh, the Miami game was contractually obligated by the league. Of those eight, ga eight games they picked, all of them were at home. And I believe all but one, I have those numbers up on the site in a story, all but one were quadrant four tomato cans that they destroyed by 35 points. I guess the committee isn't that impressed by a 40-point win over Columbia or a 35-point win over Coppin State. You got to play. Those games have so little upside and so much downside because Rutgers didn't lose. But what if they had a Lafayette loss? Then the season's over. I, I Yes, the Gonzaga thing that ended up working out. The Rutgers had tried some variation of other they were supposed to play Baylor for example the year I believe uh, uh the year to COVID Rutgers has tried but they're not trying hard enough and maybe there's a middle ground between playing the 314th ranked non-conference strength of schedule and playing you know the 189th Rutgers is one of the two teams in the Big Ten alongside Minnesota that didn't play in a holiday tournament or a multiple multi-team event that featured another high major team they're not they're not getting themselves involved in these right. you know I'm not saying we, they got to go to Bahamas or Maui or whatever. Go to you know, Charlestown or go to, I don't know, somewhere and play some someone tough on a neutral court. Steve Peichel mentioned that uh, when he was thanking the fans that they traveled to Chicago. I don't know if that's him laying the groundwork for maybe convincing one of these holiday tournaments to invite them. I have to imagine they've gotten invites since they've become better in recent years. I can't imagine they're outdrawing Nebraska basketball on the road or Penn State basketball on the road. But they got to get invited to one of these holiday tournaments. They got to make more of an effort to play high major teams. Steve Peigel always mentions that teams don't want to come play in the rack anymore, which is fine. Then go play them somewhere else. Play them on a neutral court. Do something to improve this. And from the sound of it, the way he responded yesterday didn't seem like he's particularly inclined. It seems like he's pretty ingrained in the idea that you can play eight quadrant four teams, seven quadrant four teams in the non-conference and still skate by. I think... This season and last season, when they barely made it in, are pretty good. It's pretty good proof that you should probably schedule up, especially if you're Rutgers at, at the point yeah. they are in the rebuild. Yeah, and it's not it is not a factor if they if they beat Michigan in that last home game or Northwestern last home game or we'll hold the lead against Minnesota, but they didn't. And so we're here and we're counting. You know, we're just it's you just gave you gave the selection committee a reason uh, to go against you. This is the one thing, and let me tell you tell me if you agree with this. The the thing I think the biggest beef Rutgers ha can have for me is the Ohio state loss early on. It, uh, and uh, it, there was all these, there is supposed to be stapled. The fact that the, the the refs blew that game it was supposed to be stapled to the uh, Rutgers sheet. And it's supposed to be consideration it's considered. And we thought there was, uh, we thought it wasn't going to be treated as a win, but it wasn't going to be treated as a loss and it would be a tiebreaker, Pat, right? Like they were going to, they were, I don't think they looked at it at all. I mean, I don't yeah, think there's any evidence that, it seems like right. it was just log jam with the rest of their Big Ten slate going ten yeah. and ten, whatever. So you're right. I I think it was just the afterthought. Yeah, and and again, and again, that was a bad break. That's one thing that certainly, if that if that game had been won, you certainly would look at their okay. Well, maybe maybe they're not in that position where you're debating whether or not they had a better record than Nevada. I, I mean, you might still be, but it's clear to me that that wasn't considered. And the other thing I will say this: like <clears throat> where the where the committee. It's the committee's uneven with the injury thing. It is. Yeah, I mean, I, yeah, I, yeah. It, it's not. Yeah, it's just not. It's just not. a. There's no steadfast rule like, well, when we look at every team that has loses a player or every team that gets a player back, they're going to seed them differently. It, it is really just it's a crapshoot. And, you know, I, I think that when you say that they, they, they use the Moat Mag thing against Rutgers, if you look at some other places that it wasn't quite it wasn't quite the same steadfast rule that this team's playing differently with the injury. I get that. That's another thing that I think Rutgers can be uh unhappy about. Again, it goes back to our it goes back to our, our big thing. And this and this is the other thing that's not getting talked about too. You want to put this on our what like what happened in those last six games. Like we saw a different Rutgers team in the Big Ten tournament that we saw, but but the committee wasn't watching. I guess the point I would make is that is it on Steve Peichel for not making this adjustment sooner with Derek Simpson? I mean, clearly the team wasn't playing well when Mawat Meg went out. They had evidence to suggest it that they had to do something. He waited six games. I mean, okay. So they found something, but they found it too late. That's a great point. And to your bigger point, what happened to the conference tournament that it's so devalued now? I think that's such a miss by the committee that, Rutgers really did turn it around in in the in the Big Ten tournament and and looked like a different team. But to your point, yeah, they 
it is on Pico a little bit not trusting his freshman in the in in the spot and going with Andre Hyatt in the starting lineup over Simpson because they did look like a different team and Derek Simpson proved to be the scorer that they were missing all season long. So a little bit of both. I think like what I don't understand why the Big Ten tournament was devalued so much. It's all the tournaments, over, yeah. Yeah, it's all like all tournaments. And uh and why and why Pico waited so long to uh to plug Derek Simpson. You're you're right on both points there. And it's and I, I guess we I talk, talking to Jared Carino about this as we were leaving the rack after the Northwestern game. Like we look, there's there's a pile of evidence that suggests that they don't look at the conference tournament anymore, Brian. I mean, that's just that's that's just it. And we I mean, look at where Duke is seated, you look at Texas AM last year, you look at a lot of things when you're like, all right, well, I mean, they didn't watch this. They're not they're not watching these. Yeah, and we can argue the merits of that or not, but I think everyone was kind of aware that, of that reality coming in. So um, I think people misinterpreted a lot of f- things. For example, when Brad Wachtel said it was a play-out game, right? It meant yeah. that when Rutgers and Michigan played, the loser is out of contention, not that the winner is in the tournament, right? It just means you stay alive and you don't give the committee another reason to kick you out, or it gives you a chance to keep running. The, the Simpson thing, yes, it, maybe they wouldn't have scored at 7 at 0. 0.75 points per possession against Northwestern or against Michigan, he shot 30% from the field in the Big Ten tournament. I get that the offense looks different and they actually move for a change when he's able to penetrate the paint with dribbling and and it kind of opens things up, so to speak. They didn't turn into the Showtime Lakers with the kid. I, I don't no, know. They, they, they passed the eye test though. They look like a tournament team against Michigan and Purdue. They look like they look like a different team. They Rutgers beat Michigan because its defense was significantly better and it's and Michigan was missing. Every shot they took in the second half, Rutgers missed 19 out of the last 25 shots in the first half. Rutgers was no offensive juggernaut against Michigan. They did; they really were better offensively against Purdue. I will, I will give them that, obviously. But yeah, I, I just don't, I don't buy the idea that Rutgers is suddenly looking like an infinitely better team with, with Derek Simpson, you know, in the lineup. And even the Penn State, we can argue the second half of the Penn State game when they make that 19 point comeback. Yes, Rutgers was great offensively in that second half, and Penn State also missed every shot possible. So. I'm not entirely sure I buy that if he makes this inch earlier, the season is completely different. But I guess that's a what if that Steve Peichel will have to live with for you know the rest of his coaching career and Rutgers fans will have to kind of debate amongst themselves. All right. Let's, so we we do have news. We have the NIT. The NIT tomorrow night, 7 o'clock versus Hofstra. Uh, number one seed, one of the four number one seeds. Rutgers, to give them credit, and I, I get it. There was no way Rutgers was going to turn down the NIT, but my alma mater certainly didn't seem to mind about turning down the NIT. So I guess it's something you, you can do. Rutgers said, you know what? We're, we're playing. We're in. That's good. Let's break it down. I mean, is there something? What do you expect to see from this team? And I, I guess that's my big question. Hoffers, ho- the Hoffers are coming in. They're a team that's pretty good. Had the number one seed in their, in their conference, didn't win the tournament. I don't know. I mean, this is the kind of thing where a team might come in here to the rack where Rutgers has not played well in weeks and have more motivation to to win that game than a team like Rutgers that might have punched it out for the NIT. I mean, Pat, which team do you think you're going to see here? That's such a great question. I, I've been wondering what Rutgers team is going to show up every single game the last couple of stretch because right. you just don't know. I, I think Rutgers is – the air is out of the balloon on this team. I feel like they, they know that they – probably should have been in the or they their whole goal was to be in the NCAA tournament I think that it was the deflating that they didn't get in I think they're going to be a little flat but that still doesn't mean they can't beat Hofstra I mean come yeah. on Hofstra's or, good and, and, compete, for, and good. compete for and compete for the and compete for the title yeah of course Hofstra's good shout out Jay Wright <laughs> but yeah <laughs> you're right I, I just think uh they they are a little deflated it, it was it was a gutting blow and they're going to have to find a way to, to get to get back in there, pick their energy back up. Yeah. Yeah. I guess what I I'm think, curious yeah. about is how do you guys think the fans or fan base will react to this? They have, obviously have a home game. How many people do you think are going to show up? Do you think people are going to care? Is are, is Rutgers now be you know above the NIT where people kind of go meh? That's going to be fascinating. Absolutely yeah. fascinating. Yeah. And I really do. I, I think if you put the over under at 5,000. I'm going to probably take the over, but not, but not by much. I mean, I think it's still something to do. It's a Tuesday night, though. Uh, no tickets are sold. There's not going to be a lot of excitement here, but Hofstra fans might travel. You can look at it that way. Um, it's tough, but this is when the diehards show up. We're going to see. We're going to see how many fans are on. How many fans were bandwagging it, and how many are just absolutely. I am with this team, uh, no matter where it goes. It's going to be a really good test of what the, where the Rutgers uh, fan base is right now. You're absolutely right. I'm curious to see about the students because they were so gung ho the whole season. How do the students show up for this game too? 
Right. But they, they might they might be on student on spring break. I might be wrong. Oh, there, yeah, but right. I think they're oh, on spring break. see that's yeah, you good point. Yeah, that's yeah, gonna yeah, be yeah, tough. Yeah. That's gonna make it hard. I wouldn't come back from uh, Daytona Beach for uh, Rutgers Hofstra in the first round of the NIT. Speaking of um, Daytona, uh, all I could think about in the, in the past you know twelve hours is that song you kept singing to yourself on press row in Chicago, and I I can't believe how right you were. I just didn't think this is the way you'd be right. No, the, I'm not going the Dayton song. Yeah, sing it, sing it for the crowd. Give him a little, <laughs> give him a little sample. <laughs> I know I just can't sing. It's just a bad idea for me to sing on the Fair podcast. Enough, but it was people. Uh, we have sponsors, Brian. Sure, but for the, the people at Dayton, it was I'm not going to Dayton to the tune of We're not going to take it. And it was just <laughs> over and over and over. And I was like, Steve, you're being a little optimistic. And sure enough, I guess he was. Uh, yeah, it's good. Yeah, that's exactly right. That's what we do to entertain ourselves at the Big Ten tournament. I wish I recorded um, it. That's my big. That's my big regret. That's so your big regret. Put it yeah. into the Steve's second best song behind the Gettleman parody. Right, <laughs> Dave Gettleman. Yes. Ah, good memories. All right. Do we want to take some insider questions here? Do we have any other choice? Uh, we don't. We have nothing else. And I have no. I have no. Uh, I'm not in the mood for true false. Let's just listen to what the people have to say. All right. So we got about 50 questions on the schedule. Can Fonseca explain? This is good. I'm glad they know who to go to for this question. Can Fonseca explain how you have a high net but a terrible strength of schedule? I assume the net is weighted average, where the strength of schedule is just a uh, complication complica- uh, of winning percentages. That's because of the margin of victory. Correct. No one really knows the formula for the net. They haven't never made it public. It, it, it's a lot about efficiency. I Seven of Rutgers' 19 wins were against Quadrant 4 teams. And yes, they beat them by an average of 35 points. Just absolutely obliterated these poor low major teams. I'm not sure. I, I have to imagine there's some cap on, you know, again, it's not that impressive to beat Columbia by 40 points. Like, it's just not. You probably should if you're a high major, a good high major team. So that's probably part of it. And the, the strength of the schedule probably weighs it down. Now, why is Rutgers' net... 40? I, I have no idea. I, I don't know. I mean, it was 77 when they lost to Lafayette last year. I, I don't know. Yeah. But it's, to be clear, it's it's an organizing tool. It's not the end-all, be-all. Which Another thing about the net, which is so funny, last year, no one cared about the net when Rutgers was the highest net to ever make the tournament. Yeah. 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 And all of a sudden, when Rutgers was, was terrible to start the year, but had that hot start at the end of the year, suddenly uh, the eye test and a hot finish was the most important thing possible. The, the, the committee needs to consider this. And now that Rutgers sputters to the end, all of a sudden, no, no, it's the whole body of work. I mean, the the, the gymnastics that people go through to kind right. of justify, which look, it's it's what the bubble is all about. But it's just really funny to see the same people have two completely different thought processes within 12 months of each other. Right. And the net, yeah. And then the other thing, some of the teams, I get it, like Rutgers fans were most angry about Nevada being. And well, Nevada, if they had been left out, they would have been left out. I looked it up uh, with the third, they would have been the third. Third highest net ever left out, and they had a high at thirty-seven as a higher net than Rutgers. Again, this stuff is just I could do this all day with these teams. Totally get it. All right, uh, more questions. This is this is one of my this is one of my favorite topics on Twitter last night. Dan in Lawrenceville. To me, it seems like Rutgers gets little respect from the Big Ten or from the committee, and the committee is nothing more than a bunch of administrators, as noted by Politi, who make decisions based on personal beliefs, biases, and use statistics to justify their beliefs, as opposed to using statistics to make their decisions. That was the one comment. Another one I got on Twitter last night that I just I, I tweeted out. I, I try to resist getting in there and having fights with with people, but it's just about how you know that the fans essentially the, the administrators have looked at the Rutgers in a certain way, and it's just never going to happen until this generation of people die off. And I was like, whoa, we need the Grim Reaper to solve. We need the Grim Reaper himself to come down and solve the Rutgers perception problem. I'm going to ask you, Pat, you are a Rutgers graduate. You have seen this. You know the RU screw. I, I, I was going to say, I totally agree. You totally, totally agree. agree. You think, you do I totally think there agree is a, that there is a stigma out there about Rutgers. They see Rutgers and they go, what is a Rutgers? I think like, that is still a... That is really, 50 years really old. That is older than that me. Is. There's Not just really. this perception. Even when you go to... Rutgers has always been the punchline. It always will be the punchline. Rutgers doesn't have a rival in the Big Ten. Like it's just, it's just truly feels still like there's always going to be a stigma about Rutgers. All right. All that said, this is a good. I'm glad you're taking up for the fans because I do think people, a lot of people, feel this way. All that said, did that have anything to do with them being left out of the NCAA tournament? <laughs> anything at all? I, I would, I would. Pray, I pray that it has nothing to do with it. But the 
<laughs> the Rutgers in me knows that it there is an RU screw in there. It just has to be. Even even Chris Mad Dog Russo knows about the RU screw. So, but yeah, it can't be. It can't be. But there is that little just. But maybe it's time... just being from New Jersey. Maybe it's just from being from New Jersey. You know how everyone's perception of New Jersey is too. But now we're at this. We're at this point now where every time, every time something bad happens, there's Blame someone going, oh, oh, "Oh, Druckers." There's what. There's always happens every time something bad happens. Like, oh, oh ref screwed us, Druckers. Oh, the ref screwed it because he just missed the call. I mean, I don't know, Brian. The, the Rutgers ethos it has really become a victimization. It's always things always happen to Rutgers. It's not it's not Rutgers' fault that they played a terrible non conference schedule and lost all those games. It's because the Big Ten hates them and they're biased against them and the RU screw and all this. Like sometimes you mess up, sometimes things don't go your way. Yeah. It, it, there's no grand conspiracy here against Rutgers. It's not the Big Ten's fault that Rutgers blew, again, a 10-point lead with 65 seconds to go against the worst team in the Big Ten that lost 12 straight games and had not won at home and had not won at home since that game, okay? It's 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 not – there's no – there's no the referees aren't looking at the schedule and saying, oh, my God, it's Rutgers. I got a directive from Commissioner Warren. I got to screw these guys. Right. It seems like also, Rutgers was, gets little respect from the Big Ten until – Except when the time that Jim Delaney came and invited them to the Big Ten. It was pretty <laughs> respectful. Right. And the NCAA Tournament Committee disrespects Rutgers so much, except that time that they invited them in to the tournament with the highest net ranking in the history of the tournament. When they invited them in, despite the fact they lost at home to Lafayette. Listen, they screwed Adam Corsack out of the Ray Guy Award. The, they made luckily, up for they, this year, luckily they solved that. Out of, yeah. pure, out of pure spite, That's they it. gave it to him. That's it. Uh, we could go on and on, but I'll just leave it at that. You that's know. the best part. Of, that's the best piece of evidence we've got. The guy award. That's it. You, that's it. You convinced me. Great guy. Oh, man. I love it. All right. So that's a great topic, though. I mean, every time it comes up, I just, I just, yeah. All right. Another question. Uh, was the season a success or failure? It felt like coming into this year was a rebuilding year after losing Harper and Baker, arguably our two best players. So to even be on the bubble, it feels like a success. I, I mean, it's failure is a tough word, but success is not that, that I'm not going there either. I mean, you still had, you still had what the second or third best center in the league you had the best defensive player in the league you had a, a, full, a four year starting point guard. I mean, that's dunker. Don't forget best the best dunker, dunker which best apparently dunker did not impress the committee. I guess not. Uh, Brian, are you call are you are you calling it a failure? I love this question. I think it's probably the bigger question of the entire season before, like you said, before the season, I think people would have done backflips if Rutgers made the NCAA tournament and they would have gladly accepted an NIT number one seed. Things change as there's more data, as we get evidence of what this team is. Because in the preseason, we're all just kind of guessing. Oh, they'd have no one to replace Geo Baker and Ron Harper. Oh, we, they, have, they got no one from the portal aside from Cam Spencer. Are people going to develop? There's all these questions. When those questions are answered with yes, 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 when they're 16 and 7 in January, when they're 8 and 4 and have the easiest schedule in the conference remaining, when you have, you play Minnesota twice, you play Nebraska, you have all these, you have, there is a legitimate path for you to compete for a Big Ten title. When you're at that point and then you don't make the tournament, I think it is the, the nice way to put it is an extreme disappointment. Uh, yeah. Failure, I agree with you. I'm tempted to use that word. It does seem a bit harsh. It's not good. It's I think this season, the way it unfolded, is one of the worst collapses in program history. I think that's fair to say. This is very 2004 esque. Might be even worse than that. Um, it's not good. I think if you if people want to spin it positively, there's ways to do so. I just can't shake the feeling that this was for Rutgers an incredibly disappointing season. Uh, that they're, it's going to stick in their craw for forever from here. Yeah, I mean, I guess, I guess I would look at it though. If you if you were to back up the the plane to thirty five thousand feet and look down on it, back to back NCAA's NIT. Now, I guess it, what matters is what happens next, Pat. That I guess that's to me how you're going to view this. You're are you going to view this as a blip on the all right? So we got and you could say, well, we lost Moab Mag and we would have we would have been in for another year, but we weren't. I mean, you're going to look at this as a blip, or you're going to look at it as is this a turning point? I guess that's where yeah. I come back to. Yeah, time will tell. I guess is the answer to that question, but. uh I was going to say, with to to bring this back to another football point, Steve. How does this feel compared to after beating Louisville and losing to West Virginia? The highs, the highs, and the ultimate lows is kind of what I come back to. It's just like a, 
as usual with Rutgers, a complete roller coaster. Right. I mean, that was an RU screw, that one at least. At least that was a screw. <laughs> they did get, I mean, to go from you know, the, the Big East Bulls were so bad, you go from the Orange Bowl to, you know, the, the yeah. freaking Texas Bowl. I mean, that was the, 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 the Rutgers fans can complain about that for the rest of the time. They'll be right. Um, yeah, I, I guess that, that it is on the same level a bit, but people do. The, the difference is, I think people do look back on that year is very fondly, and they always will. I'm not sure they're going to. You know, look back at this as a even even with the highs, and this team did create some some really good moments for the fan base. I think this, I think Brian's probably right. You're going to look at this. It, it's all right. It just wasn't the season we thought it was going to be. Yeah. The season it could have been, and again, it could have been exactly. It was out of their it, it, once Matt got hurt. That that was a major major blow. That I don't think anyone really grasped how important he was. But yeah, I just I just think that you know in January I was talking about a second weekend team. Uh, we were discussing legitimately if they were going to see this team in Madison Square Garden in the Sweet 16, which from there, who knows what you can do, right? And uh, just to to go to a point where they're playing Hofstra in the first round of the NIT is just a, you know, a major a major fall from grace. So and to your point moving forward, I don't think this impacts recruiting as I've seen a few people really worried. Yeah. I don't so think- So next question. Yep. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I don't think this is going to cost them any recruits really or a chance at any other recruits. I I, I would be shocked. I think recruits have a much, uh, they, they look ahead to where they're going to be. I think they, I think this coaching staff can really spin right. everything that happened here to kind of dissuade any concerns. Um, now the key here is how will they attack the portal in the off season who they will lose from the roster or I guess gain addition by subtraction from the roster and how will they fill depth? Because as we've seen this season, uh, lack of depth absolutely killed this team. And while Steve Peichel and most coaches don't like to go, you know, 13 scholarships deep, obviously I do think there is some merit to having a bit of a deeper rotation, more talent uh, and less developmental uh, aspects of the roster. I do wonder, and this is, this is, it, this is another question, question that someone asked so it's a good transition i do wonder um how this will impact the current teams recruiting i mean this part of recruiting as a college coach now is you're recruiting your own players if you had to guess right now what i mean what does this starting five look like and let's do it in order of this would be a fun exercise see if we can see if we can pull this off in order of dead solid certainty that the player is going to be in the starting five i'll start Derek simpson i can pencil him in as your as your point guard do we put? Are you going to put Paul Mulcahy in? Do you think he comes back? Does no. Cliff come back? The no way clue. the way Pyro keeps talking about no Paul Mulcahy, yeah. seems like he's not coming back. I get that feeling too. I get the feeling some of these guys sometimes you're just done with you're just done with the college thing. Uh, I think Cliff thought. I think Cliff entered this season thinking it was his last season. I don't know that it changed it would have changed his mind. I think what's going to happen is the same thing. What happened to Caleb? He's going to go look at the situation and see where. Get, get a feel for where he is professionally and make a decision based on that. I think you're both 50, 50, you know, I think, I think the, I think the freshman kid is, I think he's, you could pencil him into the starting five. I think Cam Spencer. I would say Cam Spencer is like yep. the stone cold lock. He's the stone Derek cold Sick. lock. Him he's he's their best offensive player. Like it's right. not even close. Yeah. So I, I would say Cam Spencer for sure. I'm not sure about Derek Simpson. I mean, probably he's the odds on favorite to start a point guard. No, I think at this point, maybe you go get a veteran guard in the portal, to, uh, another guy who can actually penetrate the paint, attack the rack. Cause they can't, he can't be the only guy on the roster that can do that again. Cause you're just spinning yeah. your wheels at that point. Uh, Moat Mag, Mom, I think Mo- is another Mo- yep. lock. But is uh, he going to be, is he going to be completely healthy at the start of the year? Uh, I, I, don't, I don't think he'll, I'm not entirely certain he'll be uh, fully healthy in November. I think he'll right. be able to, play basketball in November. This These things are generally, at this point, nine-month recovery, six to nine months. I think you probably ease them in when you play Coppin State and mm-hmm. Columbia and Long Island University in November. Um, so they don't look, no point. I love you, Brian. You know, one thing about you is you, when you make a point, you make it and move on. That's the great part. You know, there's no, you know. You, yeah, of course. Why would I linger on the fact that Rutgers <laughs> keeps playing these tomato cans? And You've got clearly- the same hammer. You bring the same hammer to the podcast that Steve Pucker brought to his phone. That's a, the good part about you. No, that's that's what I do. So uh, (laughs) thankfully, I don't have to buy another hammer or another phone. But yes, so when they're playing those tomato cans, they don't really have to rush him back. Uh, Yeah, my understanding is that he should be uh, when when the games start mattering. I think uh, he'd be he'd be good to go. So to Cam Spencer, Moat Mag, I think are stone cold locks to start. I think Derek Simpson is a good shot. I think they should get another point guard in the portal. Who knows how they do that? I think Michael has shown he trusts uh, or prefers to develop guys in his system than to go you know cherry pick other guys. Cliff, I, I'm fascinated by Cliff. I think a very interesting situation. I think there's a real possibility he stays, and I, I, I don't know. I wouldn't bet on it either way. 
He does love it here. I will say that he does. He really liked going. He likes being at Rutgers. Likes being in college. I mean, I I don't think that's that's not a debate. Sure, uh, they have some nil stuff to figure out, obviously, because you can't make money. And I don't know. Uh, I don't think money is a huge thing for him. I think he's he's all right with that. But I I think you know that's got to be a factor, right? Uh, also, I mean, he he developed a, a significant amount of defense defensively in his time here. He hasn't developed that much offensively. I wonder if that plays into a factor in his decision. Mm-hmm. Uh, Paul Mulcahy, who knows? I think it's an enigma what's going on there. I would not be surprised if anything happens. If he retires yeah. from basketball together, if he transfers, if he comes back, <laughs> right. if he, I, I wouldn't be surprised if anything happens. I'm not saying that I believe any, any scenario more than the other. I'm just saying I'm confounded by the whole thing. And, who else? Who else? Is like? there anybody on this bench who's not who hasn't been playing? Because this is this is the thing that a lot of people have said. I totally agree that this was an opportunity for somebody to come off this bench, and I guess it was Simpson, but he was playing. But none of the but Peichel didn't trust any of these guys. Joel didn't trust any of these guys. Who I mean, we saw with Jalen Miller. I loved the kid. He took he airballed two three pointers in that game. I'm just trying like who like who else on that bench is going to be is going to step in. So the the troll thing is is a bit separate. I don't think he he hasn't played since November. I think that there's either a redshirt attempt or something. Yeah, yeah something like that. But yeah, I, Jalen Miller, bless his heart, tries really hard. Is an absolute zero on offense and just cannot play in the Big Ten. I think that's been proven. I think he will move on and go play somewhere that's more of his level. I think Dean Reber's very disappointing season after mm-hmm. what was a pretty decent season last year. I have to think that he is a candidate to move on and and dominate so, and some mid major league in North Carolina. You know, I think Oscar Palmquist had his opportunities, and while he had some decent games, um, he had some big misses against Purdue. And uh, I think he he walked on Senior Day. He did walk on Senior Day. Yep. I think there's an opportunity there for him to spend his last two years of eligibility uh, somewhere else. He's got two years left. I didn't yeah, realize. It's two years left. Yep. Look, does Andre Hyatt want to come back, or he'll be a graduate student? He'll have one more year of eligibility. He could transfer without any penalty. Does he want to, you know, move on to greener pastures and give it somewhere else? Yeah. That's so many possible. questions, man. Yeah. It's some, wow. So uh, look, the college basketball now with the transfer portal is a year by year thing. The rosters are constantly fluid, and you never know. Which is why you've got to look at every season as an individual capsule. And again, to not to belabor the point, but that's why this season will feel so disappointing because this group will almost certainly not be the exact same next year. Uh, I mean, they won't be because Caleb McConnell is graduating. Um, and, you know, you, you move on to uh, the roster next season. So a lot of a lot of moving parts that uh, I'm fascinated to see how they all work out in the next month or so. Oh, and you got to consider also freshmen that are coming in. Jermichael Davis probably is going to play. Bay and Dongo is just ripping up the New England prep scene. He's playing great. Uh, I think, I don't know if he'll play much, uh, but I think he has a chance of being really good down the line. So uh, maybe maybe he could be a factor. And uh, Antoine Wolfolk, not bad. Antoine Wolfolk, Antoine, yeah. Really He's impressed. a 10-minute. There's 10 minutes for him someplace if he develops a little bit. Yeah. I was really impressed with him in the big Like yeah. really, really impressed with how much how much better offensively he was and yep. how little he fouled. So uh, very encouraging two-game stretch from him too. Two things uh, that, that made me think about, Brian. One, it was like, wow, this feels like a St. Peter's level diaspora of the Rutgers roster, the way you just laid it out. And two, if John Rothstein was going to come up with a catchphrase for you, it would be smashing tomato cans, Brian Fonseca. <laughs> I love it. I'm going to get that printed on a t-shirt. <laughs> Put it, exactly. Put it on a t-shirt and I'll buy one, but that's probably going to be the only one you sell. Uh, all right. That was a good breakdown. In other words, we simply can't do it. That's It's just amazing to me. I mean, I get, this is, I get it. It's college basketball in, in, in 2023, but I mean, other than four guys, we can't tell you at all. Who's going to be on this team? Who's going to start for this team? It's wild. Um, all right, let me see if there's any other questions, and then we can get the wrestling. Um, that's just about it, I guess. Uh, uh, one guy took a shot at me. This is Politi. Your last article was a quad four loss, a pathetically weak finish to a generally good season. Podcast question: How does it feel to come up short in a big moment? Thank you, Bill. I feel. <laughs> I guess okay. I'll take it. I'll take the heat. Uh, and CJ and the Baskin Rays. Here's a. You want to end the questions with this. Uh, on a lighter side, to break up the stress of the snub, <laughs> um, who is the funniest player on the Rutgers team? Funniest coach? Okay, come on. Let's do a little lighter side question, CJ. Th- thank you for breaking it up. Who's the funniest guy? Uh, Cliff. I just Cliff makes me laugh every time. He's, I think he's just, he's a hoot. Brian, you got someone? Steve Peigel has a great personality when you talk to him, you know, away from cameras and stuff. I think he's sneaky funny. I think he gets along with people very well, and he always has a great one-liner uh, he does. in situations. Um, I'm trying to think on the team uh, off the top of my head. Caleb's always joking around. He seems like he's uh, 
he, he's got some funny lines. Um, yeah, I'll go with yeah. Caleb. Okay, there you go. All right, thank you, CJ, for letting us break up. All right, Pat, we've been waiting now for like you know two weeks here for you to talk some wrestling. Where do, you in. Me, where do you want me to begin? I don't, I don't know. I don't, I have no freaking clue. Begin wherever great, you... <laughs> great column on Jay Lahan, by the way. Uh, oh, down thanks. AC. Yeah, very, very well written. Very well written. Forgot about so that. Get a big wrestling shout out for that one if people caught that one. I yes. hope they did. Yeah. Okay, Rutgers Wrestling. Gonna be a really tough NCAA tournament with the way they were seated. Their highest seat is like a 13... Dean Peterson at 125. So to get someone to finish in the top eight is going to be really difficult. Uh, we got a press conference with Goodale coming up. So I'm really curious to see what he thinks about the seeding process and where this team stands heading into the NCAA tournament. They've had uh, nine consecutive seasons with an All-American. That's people finishing within the top eight in their weight class. It's going to be realistically really tough unless someone gets really hot at the right moment to finish someone in, in that standing. So I, I don't know if you put me on the spot, a true, if you did a true or false right now, if Rutgers is going to have an all American in wrestling, I would probably say false. And that's not wow. to be a Debbie downer. It's just the the reality of where they're seated and things like that. So um, I think it's going to be a really tough, really, really tough NCAA tournament, but they did prove at the big tens after a horrible start that they were able to bounce back and really wrestle really well in tough moments. So Maybe that happens again. Who's the best shot? Uh, you would you actually go with one of the two freshmen. Uh, that's Dean Peterson, who's number thirteen seed at one twenty five, and Brian Saldano, who had a really who had the best finish at the Big Ten. He finished sixth at one eighty four. So I'd say one of those two, um, and and it's encouraging that they're freshmen. Right. Right. All right, uh, and and Goody and Goodell, he's he's kind of okay with what 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 is the long term prognosis? I guess the bigger question, you know, when you're looking at what's going to be a disappointment, like you just you just told me it's going to be a disappointing um, NCAA tournament. I mean, is the bigger picture thing here that he's got a he got to go to the transfer portal? I mean, what? <laughs> it's funny that you say that because there are a lot of Jersey guys that are going to do really well at this tournament that have yeah. extra years of eligibility that could be potential grad transfer targets. Talking Shane Griffith out of Stanford, Makai Lewis of Virginia Tech, their NCAA champions that could be could be good targets for for Goody. So if he gets any of the if he gets one of those two guys, it's like holy holy cow, that's amazing. Um, the long term prognosis is that nobody on this team, everyone on this team has an extra year can can come back if they want to come back. It's kind of the same thing as basketball, where a few of the guys may be done, injuries have really prolong their career longer than expected so um the long-term prognosis is that they should be better the next couple of years and okay. they're, they're they're really building something good gotcha okay well good. as opposed to the, the fans that are now like we need to fire goodell and start over that's Casey. Th- this is this is over like they're horrible so i think <laughs> just be patient i think that this may just be a little blip. patient 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 patience here all right. Is there anything else we have to talk about? I mean, I can't if we got uh, plenty of time to do lacrosse, baseball, and softball. Yes, uh, a couple of things. One, uh, I'll I'll pass along Lanny's compliments to you. I'll give one to Lanny. Your story on Jordan Pagano was awesome. Uh, inc- incredible. Hey, whoa, that, it's great point. Oh, Thank Jordan you for bringing Pagano. it up. Yes, yes. Tell that story. If people didn't see that. I I got lost in the the March Madness thing. But yeah, what an incredible story. Yeah, Jordan Pagano is a former Rutgers wrestler who's now in the. Uh, you know, the, the, the develop the Scarlet Knights wrestling club. It's like a development kind of program that is for Olympic development, things like that. And he volunteers as a coach on the side and he's an administrative assistant. So basically what that all means is that he coaches that he's in the room every day working with the kids and he's practicing with the kids and he's wrestling with Billy Janzer, the 197 pounder and gets put in a cradle inside wrestling right kind of kind of looks like a headlock a little bit for those that don't know and all of a sudden his body just goes completely limp and he's and 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 then that's when the panic sets in people are billy janzer's like dude what are you okay are you okay he's like i can't move i can't move and he's completely paralyzed laying on the mat and shout out to the ruckers medical staff and trainer john taggart they did a tremendous job to stabilize him in the moment make sure you know, he basically broke his neck, 
but it didn't sever his spinal cord. He just had a couple discs pressing against his spinal cord. He was paralyzed for about 45 minutes on his way to the hospital and then started getting feeling back. And it was just this incredible recovery story that uh, thankfully this kid is completely fine from a, what could have been a really tragic situation. Man, that is scary. That is scary. And he is now, is he back with the team or is he around the team? He's still around the team. Yeah. And he actually coached Bergen Catholic too when they were in AC. So it was, it was about a month after being completely paralyzed. He was back in the corner uh, coaching. Crazy. All right. Let's get to good. That is a good news story. If you hadn't read it, go dig it up on NGA.com. It was, uh, it was a fantastic read. Um, One more thing. Yep. Yes. Um, I know you said we have time to talk about baseball, but I do want to give a shout out. Uh, they had their first nine inning no hitter, the sixth no hitter in program history this weekend against nice. Georgia Southern. Uh, it was a combined no hitter. Takes away some of that shine uh, for the old school baseball heads that like to see, you know, one guy throw no hitter, but uh, pretty cool for a program that's been struggling to start the season. Uh, maybe this is the turning point for them. Um, so that was one positive to come out of Rutgers athletics and uh, Wait, lacrosse beat Princeton, right? Didn't that happen? Lacrosse yes. beat Princeton in overtime. They did. That's a good point too. All right. Thank two you. positives to come out of um, another program at Rutgers that decides to play Princeton. Um, I wonder, well, okay. you know, a little bit different. Uh, it's a little bit different. It's a little bit of the same too. I mean, look, you talk about improving a non-conference schedule uh, to, to bring up a different topic. You want to improve your non-conference schedule. There's a, you know, pretty good team down the road that would only have to come up 40 minutes. So uh, that's, that's look, just a suggestion on my part. That's all. An NCAA tournament bound team. Correct. To, if next year he just comes back and it's just like, you know, Alabama and then UCLA and it's just kind of complete, go completely opposite direction. Just slap it on the table in front of fun seconds. Ah, there you oh. go. He showed Bounding me tomato cans. Oh, dude, no tomato cans here. Oh yeah, he, no, he'd show no me Mary by Mac. doing. He'd sure show me by doing exactly what I'm asking him to do. Yes. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and look, if you go 0 and 5 against Alabama, UCLA, Houston, Gonzaga, and Baylor, that's better than going 7 and 0 against Coppin State, Bucknell, Sacred Heart, Columbia. I'm just saying. Just them for off. the resume and for the fans and for the sport, I think fans would infinitely prefer watching those games. Again, uh, it, it amazes me, honestly. I guess one credit to them is that they're able to get 6,000 people at the rack to watch Central, these terrible teams. Central so, Connecticut State on a Tuesday eight, before Christmas. Yeah, I hear eight, you. 8.30, yep. two days before Christmas, yes. They got six uh, for 4,000 or 5,000 people or whatever. That's pretty impressive. I just think it would be a better if they played actual teams of their level. Because if they want to be considered a top, bas- a top high major basketball team, which they're developing into, I think it's time to kind of schedule like you're one. All right, let's sign off on that note. Uh, again, disappointing Sunday. I think, uh, you know, speaking from for all of us, I love covering the NCAA tournament. I am sad that we won't be able to do it this year. Uh, a, a tough moment for the basketball team, NIT. Maybe we'll see you at the rack. If not, we'll be back here on the podcast to talk it all over. Thanks for listening. Thank you for listening to the Rutgers Rant. To participate in the conversation and receive live updates about the Scarlet Knights directly to your phone, sign up at nj.com slash insider.